everyone and happy Sabbath. We're just so glad that you have joined us at this time and that we can spend time with Jesus and we can contemplate him and worship him today on his special Sabbath day. I've been preparing a sermon on heaven. Um, it was kind of a last minute decision that I would speak today and um, I've just been meditating on heaven for a couple of weeks now and just finding great comfort in that and bonding with Jesus is, you know, that's the title of the sermon, Heaven is Our Home, and we're just wayfaring strangers here. And, and when we're going through a lot of battle, that's very encouraging for us. And so I thought, well, why don't I just speak about heaven? And we can even have a time of testimony where we share what heaven means to us and, and how we want to um, spend eternity with Jesus and what we want to do there. And, and we might have time for that, I'm not sure. But this morning as I was reading in Great Controversy, it was just, I was brought to tears over and over as I was reading the last pages of the last chapter. Mm. And, um, you know, it's been a while since I've read it, but I, I want to read it more often and, and the other chapters before that because it is so powerful. And um, I was just kind of transfixed with the whole thing and thought, you know, this, this amazing topic includes the great controversy before we can enjoy this heaven that we're looking forward to. And there's uh, the coronation of Christ that is so powerful and we want to uh, focus on that uh, because he has been maligned and uh, cursed and criticized and challenged and we can be a part of the team <clears throat> that supports him um, and stands by his side and exonerates him and vindicates him he says he'll vindicate us but we have the opportunity to vindicate him and so we want to be a part of that group and so today um, the theme is going to switch just a little bit to focus on vindicating Christ's name and being that bride by his side throughout eternity and being the covering, uh, the covering cherub spot that was vacated that we want to cover in our way, whatever Christ calls us to do, to vindicate his name. So that is what we want to do and um, today. And before we do, I do want to say a word of prayer to ask the Lord to help me with this awesome subject about an awesome God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to live, that you've created us, and the purpose that you've given us. And here in this last generation, before you come, we have an unusual opportunity, not only in Earth's, all of Earth's history, but throughout eternity, as the 144,000 will follow the Lamb wherever he goes, witnessing about his great power to free us from this horrible sinful earth to free us from sin, to free us from the enemy that tries to kill us, and that you are the great victor. And so, Jesus, I just pray that you will forgive me of all of my sins and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus, and that you will purify me so and all of us so that we can stand before you and speak a word for you and speak our testimony for you, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit and Jesus and your angels will speak uh, for me and through me now at this time as we turn the time over to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I think I would like in um, thinking about this topic, I would like to start with one of my favorite verses. I don't have it in my notes, but it's in my heart. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, as we think about Jesus and who he is and the plan of redemption and the power of it and Philippians is so awesome as Jesus leads the way to show us the path that we are to go here on this earth Philippians chapter 2 and I'm just going to read verses 1 through 11 mm. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, 
if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Mm. It's probably the hardest thing for humankind to do. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And in the King, New King and King James, it says the mind of Christ, that we are to have the mind of Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in a very few short verses, we see the whole great, great controversy, the plan of redemption, how he laid himself down so low. Humankind is way low for him to come down to. But not only that, to humble himself to death, not only that, death on a cross. And God the Father is going to restore and vindicate everything and raise him up to the highest place and give him a name above every name and that every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord. And this is the picture in the great controversy that I was reading about how this is all going to happen and how the wicked and how the evil angels and how Satan himself bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord when he's raised up raised up above the new Jerusalem on the third coming. It's such a beautiful story and I want to read some of this to you as we think about this great glory of heaven that, that is to be restored. It's all based on this beautiful plan that Jesus and the Father worked out in that private conference between the two of them before they even created one being what would happen if anybody left? What would happen if anybody fought back and rejected God? All the plan is being worked out. And in my study, I um, also uh, wanted to just reveal a little bit about how all the people that have gone before us have seen a little tiny glimpse of this glory and of this picture and of this scene and were willing to walk the path and follow Jesus. And we here have this opportunity to finish the race. Interestingly enough, and I'll just mention a few that are talked about in the scriptures and in Ellen White, that there were a few who had visions of this. And patriarchs and prophets, surprisingly enough, revealed that even Adam himself had a vision of the future glories that were to happen in heaven and at the final events of Earth's history. I was surprised. I didn't realize that Adam had that opportunity. And I didn't have time to go back and find the exact page, but I'm like, that is so amazing. And he shared for his almost a thousand years with the people of that age, the, the scenes and the things. And then we have also Enoch, who um, had visions um, and Enoch lived long, you know, past when the time that Adam was there and he had visions of the end and then the glories of heaven. The whole scenes were there before him. And then Abraham too. Um, also in Patriarchs of Prophets, it was mentioned, and I hadn't known that, that he also saw these scenes 
of the end of the world and the second coming of Christ in the visions and glories of heaven. And then we know that, um, and he was to begin the new nation after Noah. And uh, then we have uh, places in the scriptures that talk about from Ezekiel who had uh, visions, Ezekiel 1, where he sees the throne room in heaven and Isaiah has many chapters in there and we'll look at some of those texts. And then we also know that Daniel and John had many visions that allowed them to see the glories and the end result of the victories that Christ won for us here on this earth. <clears throat> and as we look at Hebrews, we see that there's a long line of people of the faithful before us that tread this path but that they did not finish the path. They did not receive the glories. But you and I, who are at the end of time, right here before Jesus comes again, are the ones that ha are handed the last baton to run this race around the course and be there for this last great battle on planet Earth before his second coming. And we get to participate in that. And they are waiting for us. <laughs> Those who have, are resting in their graves, they're waiting for us to finish this, this path. And um, it, it, uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who has promised is faithful. And this promise is the second coming and the victory to be won. And then we read in uh, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, where the hall of faith of all the ones before. And it says in verse 13 through 16, it says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them, that holy city. That is just so awesome. What city is this? Jesus spoke to his disciples to encourage them before he left. And this is just another very favorite uh, verse in John 14, 1 through 3. And that was our scripture reading today. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And we often have trouble in our hearts. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This is the heart cry of Jesus, that he was going to miss them. And the, one of the reasons our heart is not to be troubled is because he has a special place prepared for us in heaven. And we really need to focus on that more than what we do. Often we, you know, consider the battle and we consider Jesus and, and we think about when he was on this earth and such things. But we need to think about the heavenly place too and how much he is preparing a place for us. And not just a room, not just a mansion, but a special place of work where we are going to do our blueprint with Jesus. He has it all lined up, you know, not just for the disciples that were going to sit at either side, that they wanted to sit at either side, but he said, God the Father has whoever he's prepared for, that's who's going to sit on the left and the right. And he has all these different places of, of ministry and work throughout eternity, a place where we can do our blueprint and work and be with him as well as a beautiful mansion, a beautiful home, where he can be with us and we can be with him. And this place needs to be 
something that motivates us day by day, that we can dwell on. Ellen White talks about how we should contemplate heaven and that we should talk with our children about it and help them to realize the, um, the things that are so important in heaven. Then it goes and finishes Hebrews 11 and all the, um, the victories there that the people had. But then in verse 39 and 40, 40, it says, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that, the, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So that cleansing and perfecting message that we need to learn for ourselves and go completely through the cleansing and purification of our souls so that we can live through after the time of probation closes and Jesus comes out of his intercessory role in the heavenly sanctuary. He takes off his priestly garments and because it is finished, his character is now fully reflected in his people. We don't know when and how that's all going to happen, but we're to cooperate with the cleansing so that he can do this. Then he'll put his kingly robes on and he'll be ready to come and resurrect the dead and lift us up to the glories of heaven. And together with us, that perfection and that victory in that last round that needs to happen to win the victory over the enemy who says, we don't need to keep a law and you can't keep the law. We need to prove and to, to the universe that God is faithful and he can do this perfecting work in his people, not with our strength and power, but all with his strength and power as we yield ourselves, surrender ourselves to him and let him cleanse us completely so that Jesus can be exonerated throughout eternity and give that victory that he has won for us and through us to all the dead that are waiting for this final work to be completed. And we can have a part in that. Is that your desire? To have a part Amen. in that victorious message that God wants to do and to, um, to win completely over the, the, the battle over the enemy. And this is where the battle is to be won. Just like he won it on the cross. We need to win that battle with, by hanging to Jesus, clinging to Jesus on the cross as we go through our cross experiences, through the cleansing and through Jacob's trouble at the very end. Then Jesus can win this great battle and he will come and get us and rescue his bride. Let's read about the bride here in Revelation 19. Revelation 19 shows um, a fantastic picture of Jesus on a white horse coming to get his bride and how the enemies with his two-edged sword, you know, all are down, go down as he lifts up his, his bride. And um, in verse 6, it's, it's how excited that the people in heaven are and the great multitude as he's winning this battle. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. This is his victory. He's going to reign over everything. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So we are now, as we have this bright, clean linen garment to wear, it includes that our behaviors are, are we are cleansed such that our behaviors are able to just come right out in righteous acts before God and before the world to win this battle that the enemy has said, we don't need a law, we can't have a law, Nobody can keep the law. It doesn't matter about the law, etc. And we're saying the law is all about love and all about Jesus and all about um, he, his, his victories that he wants to win in our lives because slavery to sin is, is a pitiful existence. And we obey that law of sin and death 
instead of the law of life and love and happiness. And I did another, um, another message just on the Ten Commandments and how that is the law of love it to be in our hearts. This is the victory that Jesus wants to give us, that we win over the enemy. Um, there's just a couple of other verses here, and then I want to go to great controversy and just share with you some of those insights. But in Daniel, a lot of times we focus on the prophecies, of course, of the future and of, of heaven. Um, let's see if killed you. But I want to just focus and highlight the verses that talk about King Jesus. Uh, we often think about the image and how it comes down and it falls. We think about the, the animals that represent the kingdoms. Uh, the image was also about the kingdoms of this earth and how um, they either fall and the other ones rise or whatever. And it's just a fascinating, wonderful story, and I love teaching that. But uh, I would like to just have us think about how awesome it is that all this is about the kingdoms of this earth that follow sinful pathways are going to fall beneath the rise of King Jesus, who is forever going to be our leader and our king and to have the kingdom of heaven forever and ever throughout eternity and how important that is in our lives. And so we look at Daniel 7 and um, 7, 9, and 10, which is the ones I usually read, are about the, the judgment of the living and how the books are open and the investigative judgment uh, begins. And that's just some more of my favorite verses. But here in verse 11, it says, then I watch, continue to watch because of the boastful world, words the horn was speaking. So here we have a bit of a battle. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven and he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence and that's when he goes into the most holy place but i like this part where it says he was given authority glory and sovereign power all peoples nations and men of every language worshiped him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed and as we're coming to the time where we're going to be voting in the fall here for another president of the United States in 2020, I am just so thankful that this is extremely temporary, that Jesus Christ is going to be the one I vote for. I vote for him. I want him to be the everlasting dominion. We will never vote again because he is going to be it forever and ever and ever. We have shown that we cannot do this down here on earth with sin um, infiltrating every part of, of our land and our governments and the world powers. And Jesus knows this. And he's been very patient and he's given us time. But then he is going to reign supreme. But you know what? We come to think about we really need to put our vote in. We need to, to shout from the mountaintops that we want King Jesus to win this battle, that he is the one. He is King Eternal. And um, I'll read just a couple more verses with that in mind. 21, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days, God the Father, came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. So we're going to have a role to play in this new kingdom. We'll get to rule under Jesus Christ, our, our king, our president, our everything. And we're going to follow his plan and his rules. Verse 26, but the, king will, the court will sit and his power will be taken away, completely destroyed forever. And that's going to be the enemy. Then the sovereignty power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers 
will worship and obey him. That is the government and the kingdom that we want. And it's our turn to voice this as we do the loud cry and the last message to this world. We are putting our vote in and saying, we choose Jesus Christ, not the enemy, not the ruling powers of this earth, but the ruler of the universe. He is the one that is worthy. Worthy is the lamb. He is the one that is fair. Through all the accusations, we need to be like a covering, like a bride that is going to second witness our heavenly husband and say he is true and faithful. He is fair with us. He is protects us. He is loving and kind from the Old Testament to the New and from the heavens um, now where he is and forever and ever. And it's our part to, t to um, sound that cry to the world at this time when God is going to let everything go and he's going to let the two kingdoms show who is who. And just like the angels did before uh, Lucifer became Satan and was cast out of heaven, we need to be on that winning side and saying, we're with Jesus. We're standing here by the throne and, and God is going to win this battle. It's so beautiful. And so on that note, I think that I would like to share some of these beautiful things from the great controversy. And though we've read it probably in the past, we need to read it again um, and again. And it's in the chapter, The Great Contro uh, the Controversy Ended. This is where the good news is. And the chapters before and the story before, of course, is how Jesus comes the second time. His first time as a humble baby in Bethlehem. The second time is at the end of this earth's history um, of people being alive on this earth and ruling in this earth. And uh, Jesus comes and resurrects the righteous and we go up to heaven with him. And those who are living will join together and, and will uh, be there for how many years? 1,000 1, years in heaven, okay? And this is where there will be a time of the, of the judgment is going to happen. And um, I'm not sure if I can find this really quick or not. Maybe, maybe I don't need to take time to look up the quotes about that. Um, just to say that we will be opening up the books of the wicked. You can look in the book heaven or uh, the great controversy to find quotes about this and scriptures. There are many scriptures that also support this, that she has list, listed about five to seven of the scriptures about how we will judge the wicked and we will look over all these books and we will see what has happened over the 6,000 years and, and before that when Lucifer fell and we'll all get to see what happened and to make further decisions about how awesome the God we have chosen is so right and so good and so fair and powerful. And we will have a thousand years to rest as well as take time to look at these things that are, um, that are needing to be finished up because the great controversy is not ended at the second coming. It is not ended during those thousand years in heaven. There is still more to go through and experience so that the final coronation of Christ can take place at the end of the thousand years with his bride, all human family, fully comprehending after studying everything and understanding everything, fully comprehending who our king is, who our heavenly husband is, and that then that will be shared with the wicked mm -hmm. after that time. But we've got to be by his side. Mm -hmm. We have to be a, um, a pure bride, a um, knowledgeable bride about our husband, and fully in love with Jesus in deeper and deeper measures. Because many people also remember will be there in heaven that know nothing about Jesus. They have a lot to learn. Many of us know many things, mm -hmm. but they have a lot to learn. They may have never heard of the name Jesus. Um, they may have been, you know, thousands and millions from other faiths, uh, from even, you know, heathenism. There will be people who had yielded to the Holy Spirit. They never knew about God, um, the true God, and they just yielded to the Holy Spirit the best they could. 
and God took that as righteousness as they surrendered their life to the Holy Spirit's leading. And so there's so much that we need to learn, even those of us who know, know a lot, a thousand years of learning of who this King Jesus is. And then it's time to finish the great controversy. At that time, we will, um, oh, by the way, where is, where is Satan and, and the evil angels? bound to this earth for a thousand years, where it is left desolate and where Satan will um, be in agony. I think I can, let's see that there's a couple of quotes here. During this time when he's bound to earth, Satan suffers extremely. Since his fall, his life of intense activity has banished reflection but he is now deprived of his power and left to contemplate the part which he has acted since first he rebelled against the government of heaven and to look forward with trembling and terror to the dreadful future when he must suffer for all the evil he has done and be punished for the sins he, that he has caused to be committed. So that's what he's doing and the evil angels all here and the wicked are all dead um, and through the whole thousand years and they ha they're in this waiting time until the righteous uh, and, and the New Jerusalem. And you remember that verse. We'll read it straight from the scripture. So let the scriptures talk that John saw this and wrote it in Revelation chapter 21. And where it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the Holy Spirit, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So he's coming down, this beautiful city is coming down out of heaven. But before everything is done in the new heavens and the new earth, after the city is coming uh, down, in chapter 20, just a couple few verses before, it says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations of the four corner corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle because they see this city coming down. <laughs> um, it says, in, the, in number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But then the fire comes down. But before that, it says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which the book was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. So here we have this time, this final time, of the, the judgment, and we are going through the investigative judgment of uh, the righteous right now, before the close of probation, while Jesus is still our intercessor. But then it, there will be the end of that, and then after the thousand years will be the judgment of the wicked before the final de uh, destruction and the great controversy ending. Uh, so I want to maybe pick up here. The whole wicked world stand arraigned at the bar of God in the charge of high treason against the government of heaven. They have none to plead their cause. They are without excuse. And the sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them. It is now evident to all that the wages of sin is not noble independence and eternal life, but slavery, ruin, and death. That's what we need to tell people now, that, that it is not, we're not slaves when we follow God's law of life and liberty, but when we follow Satan, and then <clears throat> it's slavery, ruin, and death. As if trans, um, entranced, 
The wicked have looked upon the coronation of the Son of God. They see in his hands the tables of the divine law, the statutes which they have despised and transgressed. They witness the, in the outburst of wonder, rapture, and adoration from the saved. And as the wave of melody sweeps over the multitude without the city, all with one voice exclaim, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Revelation 15, 3. And falling prostrate, they worship the Prince of Life. So our testimony, I never knew this, this was new light to me, that our testimony as Jesus is being lifted up in that great white throne and he's being the coronation and the pages before we're talking more and more details about the coronation. That then when we are in this outburst of wonder and rapture and we're so excited about the, the coronation of Jesus Christ as King of Kings, that that uh, waves out over us and then out to the rest of the people, that all the other people are affected, the wicked are affected by our testimony at that time of the time of Jesus Christ's coronation. I think it's so beautiful that we have that influence and that the Holy Spirit, and they fall and they worship the Prince of Life at this time. Satan seems paralyzed as he beholds the glory and majesty of Christ. He who once was a covering chair remembers whence he has fallen. Mm -hmm. A shining seraph, son of the morning, how changed, how degraded. From the council where he was once honored, he is forever excluded. He sees another now standing near the Father, veiling his glory. He has seen the crown placed upon the head of Christ by an angel of lofty stature and majestic presence, and he knows that the exalted position of this angel might have been his. Mm -hmm. Memory recalls the home of his innocence and purity, the peace and content that were his until he indulged in murmuring against God and en envy of Christ, his accusations and his rebellion, his deceptions, to gain the sympathy and the support of the angels, his stubborn persistence in making no effort for self-recovery when God would have granted him forgiveness all come vividly before him. He reviews his work among men and its results and the enmity of man towards his fellow man, the terrible destruction of life, the rise and the fall of kingdoms, the overturning of thrones and the long succession of tumults, conflicts and revulsions. He recalls his constant effort to oppose the work of Christ and to sink man lower and lower. <clears throat> he sees that his hellish plots have been powerless to destroy those who have put their trust in Jesus. As Satan looks upon his kingdom, the fruit of his toil, he sees only failure and ruin. He has led the multitudes to believe that the city of God would be an easy prey, but he knows that this is false. Again and again, in the pro uh, progress of the great controversy, he has been defeated and compelled to yield. He knows, knows too well the power and the majesty of the eternal. But the time has now come when the rebellion is to be finally defeated and the history of the character of Satan disclosed. In his last great effort to dethrone Christ, destroy his people, and take possession of the city of God, the arch deceiver has been fully unmasked. Those who have united with him see the total failure of his cause. Christ's followers and the loyal angels behold the full extent of his machinations against the government of God. He is the object of universal abhorrence. Mm. And so, at this time then, there begin, even though the people see this, then Satan, um, I wanted to find the part where, um, okay, I think it's right here. Um, I also had skipped one part over here that I didn't know if I should, um, oh, I, I really had wanted um, to read this part here. 
uh, about how the phone uh, the, about the throne. It says above the throne is revealed the cross, and like a panoramic view appear the scenes of Adam's temptation and fall, and the successive steps in the great plan of redemption, the Savior's lowly birth his early life of simplicity and obedience, his baptism. So here, a panoramic view. It's like the wicked and everybody, um, and this is what causes them to kneel, um, and what I already read. But before that, they were having this big movie on the screen of the sky where they were seeing Jesus Christ and the redemption that he did for them, how he came as a baby. They get to see the picture. Um, his baptism in Jordan, the fast and temptation in the wilderness, his public ministry, all these, um, his public ministry, unfolding to men's heaven's most precious blessings. And it goes on to show all the things that happened in Jesus' life as being seen by everybody, the plot, plottings of evil and hate and malice, and then Gethsemane and the crushing weight of sin of the whole world. His betrayal at the hand of the murderous mob and the fearful events of that night of horror, the unrestraining prisoner mm. forsaken by his beloved disciples, rudely hurried through the seats of streets of Jerusalem, the Son of God exultingly displayed, bef displayed before Annas, arraigned in the high priest's palace, in the judgment hall of Pilate, before the cowardly and cruel Herod, mocked, insulted, tortured, and condemned to die are all vividly displayed and portrayed in this movie that these people are seeing. All the righteous and the wicked are seeing this. <clears throat> and then it is at this time that um, <clears throat> the awful spectacle appears just as it was. Satan, his angels, and his subjects have no power to turn from the picture of their own work. Each actor recalls the part which he performed. Herod, Herod, who slew the innocent children of Bethlehem, and on and all. Everybody is showing that um, what Jesus did and uh, that they vainly seek to hide from the divine majesty of his countenance, outshining the glory of the sun, while the redeemed cast their crowns at the Savior's feet, exclaiming, he died for me. Mm. So be before the wicked and the, the righteous, this whole uh, coronation and experience, the end of the controversy is being displayed. And um, in one of these, it says that, uh, and I'm not sure, oh yes, right here. As soon as the books of record are opened the, to the wicked, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. So all these things are being opened to them and to everyone so that that the great controversy can be ended, so that this wonderful um, heaven that God is giving us as an inheritance can be uh, won and experienced. But right now is the time when we can voice and save the last that are still open here like Noah before the, um, the, the door being shut, closed on the ark before the flood. We have an opportunity to be like Noah and stand and, and preach uh, for Jesus and to be the bride of Christ to say, come, come. Remember that in the, um, in, in, uh, Revelation 22 in, uh, verse 17, it says the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come, whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. We still have that door of probation opened so that the wicked don't have to, they don't have to be a part of the wicked and see their books opened then. Now is the time of the books being opened for the judgment of the living now. When Jesus can come to you and I and say, there are sins here. Would you be willing to confess them? I will cleanse your book. I will clean every page in a cooperative 
experience with Jesus, not a, a, a final pronouncement of damnation, but a cooperative experience. He wants us to go over the books with him so he can cleanse them all. So we don't have to see them like the wicked did where everything's just already there forever. You know, he can be cleansed and purified. Then I wanted to share this, um, I think, yes. Uh, one reminder alone uh, uh, remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of his crucifixion upon his wounded head, upon his side, his hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. Says the prophet beholding Christ in his glory, he had bright beams coming out of his side and there was the hiding of his power. That pierced side which flowed the crimson stream that reconciled man to God, there is the Savior's glory, there of hiding of his power. And I just think that this was so awesome when I read this this morning, how this is like Adam when he had that rib that was taken out of him, the surgery of the first Adam to make Eve, that Jesus Christ's side was pierced. And that's where the second Eve, where the second Eve, all mankind redeemed uh, are going to be at his side. And that side is where he was pierced for our transgressions. And we can be fully redeemed and fully by his side as his bride and um, appreciating fully the sacrifice that he made. That, and the tokens of his humiliation are his highest honor through the eternal ages. The wounds of Calvary will show forth his praise and declare his power. And um, another one of these quotes that I read was how that light comes out, that Ellen White says that light comes out of wow. his hands where the, where the scars are. Wow. So Jesus allowed himself to have that surgery for his bride. That, but now he wants us by his side. He's like, I've had the surgery. I want my bride with me. I want to come and rescue my bride from the enemy and to end this great controversy forever. And that the destruction of the wicked then um, <clears throat> comes as Satan rushes upon the city again. He tries to get the people to rush upon the city. But do you know that it says that they are so angry, but they're now angry at Satan. He still goes forward to try to capture the city, but they cannot do it. They come up off their knees and they are livid and they attack Satan. And, and, are, and, and then that's when the hellfires come down and burn up all the wicked and burn up all of Satan and, and everything that was there. I'm kind of out of order, but it's okay. The Lord is helping. Um, and burn up all the wicked and there'll be ashes under our feet in Malachi. And such a beautiful, beautiful um, experience that then the great controversy will be ended. There will be no more sin. There will be no more remnants other than Jesus and the power that comes out and the light that comes out for him being our heavenly husband to rescue us this way. It is so, so beautiful what God has planned for his people. Then right here on um, this last page um, in the Great Controversy, 678. Uh, we just want to just contemplate a little bit here about Jesus again. It says, and the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the redeemed thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy, they sweep the harps of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Wow. I mean, this is so, so powerful to see that these 
things are going to unfold throughout eternity and him being our, our, our hero and our victor over the enemy will never be forgotten and how we will have special songs of praise and adoration forever and ever. And then the very last, um, the very last paragraph, I really, I'm not much of a singer, but I kind of would like to sing the song that we learned when we were kids. Um, my sister and I, my brother, um, we went to a little one room school and they taught us some, it was almost like um, special heavenly choir music, some of the songs. We learned the Ten Commandments to song. Um, our teacher just had this wonderful um, music, choir music for, for young people and that we learned. And one of them was this last paragraph of the Great Controversy that we learned to sing. And I can't believe after all these many years that I can still remember it, but I was singing it this morning and um, I'd kind of like to sing it. And then after that, I would like for us to um, have the, um, my sister, the pianist to play I Surrender All at the very end. But I'm gonna start out by reading this and then I want to see if I can sing it. If I can't, I won't, But because I know I'm being videoed and I'm not a singer, but um, I want to try. I'll read it first. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Do you remember that song? <laughs> no, not really. So it kind of goes like this. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all, flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illuminable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Amen. It's just so beautiful and I used to sing that a lot and just yeah. love that. Before I could even really read the, the great controversy, we learned that as a child and that's going to be the song of eternity. And I would like to close now with us just bowing our heads and singing, uh, singing, I surrender all, because this is what we need to do before this great battle is going to be won. We have to do our part. It's not finished yet. We must surrender our all on a level we've never done before, before Jesus comes back. Our complete and our all is what he needs this last generation to do. So I'm going to um, grab my hymnal so that we can very reverently sing this song. It's um, number 309 that we'll sing together in a very reverent promise. This is a prayer promise, covenant with God that we are going to surrender all to him and let him win, okay? to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence 
daily lift. Monona, would you like to come up here and help sing? Yeah. The, the She's an awesome, yeah. uh, she has sung many um, times publicly, um, but maybe not recently, um, but in her in her past she has, and she has a beautiful, um, a, um, what is it called? Soprano. Soprano voice, yes. And I'm an alto, and I'd really like for her to sing. Okay, so you can really sing out. We'll sing the chorus now, and then start verse two. I Verse 2. Father, I thank you so much that when we surrender our all, you do the rest, and you're going to take us all the way through to the glories of heaven throughout eternity, and we will worship you forever and ever in joy and bliss and gladness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.